opportunity to talk to um, all of the families, uh, some of whom attend our clinic here in Fort Worth and some who are coming from around the country. Uh, and it's great to talk to everyone on live stream. Um, if there's anyone out there who I know already, I'm saying hi. What do you need me to do, Anson? They may need, they can't hear the PC at full volume, so I may okay. need to turn it up. Uh, can, can you all hear me now? It's a long way over the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I may need to. I'm sorry, sir. That's okay. Is that a little better now? Yes, thank you, okay. sir. So um, I thought it would be interesting. Uh, I'm going to be basically here to talk to you guys for a few hours. And uh, the first hour, I thought what I would do is uh, talk to you a little bit about the history of hyperinsulinism, how it was first discovered and uh, take you all the way through to the present time and talk a little bit about the research that we're doing uh, throughout the world, not just necessarily our research, but what's really happening in the field of hyperinsulinism. And then for the second hour, um, I understand that many of you have already emailed in uh, questions that you'd like to me to address, so we'll field all your questions and answer the questions of uh, the people who are here in the audience. So I thought I'd start off first and talk a little bit about um, the history of uh, how we got here. So it's a very interesting history because it really starts with diabetes and, and really what's most interesting is that the latest information that we're seeing now is all coming from diabetes as well. So this disease is intricately uh, related to diabetes although it's really the opposite in the sense that our disease is too much insulin uh, causing low blood sugars and diabetes is not enough insulin causing high blood sugars. But back in, um, in the early 19, 20th, 20th century in the 1910s to the 1920s, uh, when patients were diagnosed with diabetes, uh, they made the diagnosis by noticing that these, uh, it was primarily children and young adults would be peeing excessively and they would start to lose a lot of weight, they would become dehydrated. And someone noticed that when they tested the urine, uh, that the urine tasted sweet. And so they named the condition diabetes mellitus because mellitus is derived from the Latin word for, for sugar. Um, and and when, when these uh, kids were diagnosed, they realized that the only way to treat them was to starve them completely of all sugar in the diet, just have them eat protein, have them exercise every day. And they used to go to... Um, health, I guess you wouldn't call them health resorts, but uh, I can't remember what they were called in the old days, um, but they would go to places like the beach and they would swim up and down in the water all day long and run up and down on the beach. And the idea was that if you exercised and you ate only protein, you could keep the urine from being sweet. And if you kept the urine from being sweet, in other words, having sugar in the urine, that you might survive. And these people who were diagnosed could live for six months. Um, but everyone died eventually, and so diabetes was a fatal disease at that time. And when these kids died, someone noticed that when they examined the pancreas in these children who died, that the pancreas was uh, being destroyed and had lost all of the um, islets of Langerhans in there. So they noticed that this, the pancreas was all shriveled up and not functioning properly. And so two doctors in Canada, Banting and Best, uh, thought that if they took some pancreases out of dogs and they mushed them up and uh, got an extract of the pancreas and they injected it into a human that that might keep these kids alive and so they discovered insulin and that was in 1921 and so they injected the first couple of kids with insulin and they thought uh, they realized that they were able to stop the urine from being sweet because they couldn't measure glucose at that time so they would give an injection the urine wouldn't be sweet anymore the kids would start to gain weight and these kids started to survive. And so this was the discovery of regular insulin. Now, of course, there were huge problems with it because they were extracting it from dogs. It wasn't terribly pure. Um, but nonetheless, we were looking at a fatal disease that suddenly uh, transitioned into living for a couple of years. And gradually over the 20s and 30s, as they started to uh, better identify insulin and purify it, uh, they were able to treat people who started living 10, 15 years. So there was great excitement in the early 1920s because they thought they had cured diabetes. 
And then in the 1930s and 40s, they realized that all these people that they thought they cured started having problems. They started getting blindness. They started uh, having sores on their body that wouldn't heal. And hence, they discovered the long-term complications of diabetes. And it really took until the 1960s and 70s to realize, and, and in fact, really not until the late 1980s when a big study was done called the Diabetes Control and Complications Trial that showed that if you could keep the blood sugar as near normal as possible, you could prevent the long-term complications. So that was a very exciting time. Now, in the 30s and 40s, some people were noted to be having low blood sugars, and they were found that they had unexplainable low blood sugars, and when they measured different things in their blood, they found that they had elevated insulin levels. And so in adults, it was found that these kids had, uh, or these adults had tumors on the pancreas, and so the first sort of islet, ad, uh, the first adenomas, which is a benign tumor of the pancreas, uh, were discovered and they realized, um, I think it was in the Mayo Clinic, they first started doing surgery where if they removed the tumor, they could cure the low blood sugar. But then they started to see this happening and in uh, 1950, a man called Macquarie uh, reported that there had been a series of children who were having low blood sugars that couldn't be explained and that when they looked in their blood, they found they had elevated insulin level. And he noted at the time that 50%, that's one in two or half of those children, were severely brain damaged. And he thought that this was a very serious disease and felt that glucose must be very important for brain development and that having low blood sugars was uh, very risky. And he called upon the endocrine and neonatal community of that time to start thinking a little bit more about these babies and to try and uh, evaluate why they were having these low blood sugars. And so um, the story continues that uh, around the US and in different parts of the world, several doctors started to become very interested in this disease. Um, there were some uh, people up in Toronto, um, uh, Lester Baker in Philadelphia really is sort of the father of this, uh, the latest changes that have happened. And throughout the country, uh, down in uh, Houston, uh, various different doctors started to get involved. And um, in, in 1989, I first came to Philadelphia and started working there. And one of the first, we were seeing about four to six kids a year uh, that we were operating on. And we were probably at that time the biggest center and probably around the country everyone else was doing maybe, maybe all the big children's hospitals were operating on maybe one, maybe two at most uh, children a year. And so, we started looking at our children and we realized that we had a high proportion of Ashkenazi Jewish families who had hyperinsulinism and we noticed that many of them uh, who had large families of six or seven children were having one or two or three affected children. And so we felt that this must be a genetic disease, that this was not by chance that someone got hyperinsulinism and everybody else didn't, that there must be some genetic component. And so one of the very first projects I started on when I got to Philadelphia in 89 was we started collecting blood from all of our families for DNA analysis and we worked with um, uh, some doctors who were in St. Louis, uh, Ben Glazer who was uh, on sabbatical from Israel and Alan Permit who was a big researcher in type 2 diabetes and uh, a doctor in Philadelphia, Rich Spielman uh, and together with Lester Baker and Charlie Stanley, we started looking at all these families and we were able to isolate a single common point on the genome. So as you all know, I'm sure everyone carries 46 chromosomes and there are 23 pairs. You get one set of uh, 23 from your mother, one set from your father. And so it combines to give you the full set of 46. And so we looked at all of the chromosomes and found that on chromosome 13, there was an area that most people who had hyperinsulinism, and when I say most, remember we're talking about a, a huge group of Ashkenazi Jewish patients, uh, that they had the same region of the chromosome was very common amongst them all. And so we discovered this in about 92, 93, and published this data that we thought that the cause of hyperinsulinism was on chromosome 13. And about a year later, in uh, Texas, uh, Lydia Aguiar Bryant and her husband Joe Bryant were again working in type 2 diabetes and looking at different genes that might cause type 2 diabetes and they isolated a gene that they called the sulfonylurea receptor. 
And lo and behold, it was right where we said we thought the gene for hyperinsulinism was. And so they had a fellow called Pamela Thomas. Um, and when I was doing my work, I was a fellow as well. It's a training stage in, um, in endocrinology. And so she had a couple of uh, families who happened to be from Saudi Arabia, um, and they were not Jewish. And uh, she happened to have the DNA. And when someone in her same hospital had found this uh, gene called the sulfonylurea, they said, well, why don't we sequence the gene in our children? And lo and behold, they found the first mutations uh, in the sulfonylurea receptor. And so really that was published in Science in 1995, and that was really the start of all of the genetic explosion that's occurred, where we now know that there are probably nine different genetic forms of hyperinsulinism. Now, all this time in Philadelphia, we uh, started to have a reputation as being the center where kids with hyperinsulinism would come, and so by the mid-1990s, we were starting to see six to ten babies a year and starting to develop a lot more expertise. And um, we had a surgeon there many years ago who really had done a wonderful job from 1960 to the mid-1990s and then Scott Adzik moved in and became the uh, chief of surgery and he became our pancreatic surgeon. Um, around that time now there was some very exciting stuff going on in France. And in France, there was a, a group in the Hospital Enfant Malade uh, in Paris, and they were working with a pathologist uh, from uh, Belgium called Jacques Raye. And Jacques Raye was a brilliant pathologist who would look at the slides and examine the pancreases of every baby that was operated in Paris. And so he would fly over to Paris when they were doing an operation, and he would review the histology. And in the early 1990s, he discovered that when they did the operations, that there seems to be two patterns that he noticed. One pattern was that babies would have abnormalities in all of the islet cells in the pancreas. So remember, the islet cells are a bunch of uh, cells that contain the beta cells that secrete insulin, but they also have alpha cells and D cells that secrete glucagon. So uh, these are all bunched up together and then the rest of the pancreas there are cells that secrete enzymes to help digest our food. And so he noticed that when he looked in the islets that many of these babies who had severe, severe hypoglycemia that would have 98% of their pancreas removed and would still have hypoglycemia after the operation that they had changes in all of the islet cells throughout the pancreas. And what he noticed was is that the nuclei, which is the part of the cell that holds all the DNA material that codes for all the genes that makes all the enzymes, the nuclei were bigger. And so he noted that this nuclear hypertrophy occurred in all the cells. And then he noticed that in some of the kids who'd had a 98% pancreatectomy and were cured and didn't have any more hypoglycemia, that when he looked for that nuclear hypertrophy, he couldn't find it in all the cells. In fact, the cells were all really small and they looked like they were resting. But he would find a small area of the pancreas where there was this massive proliferation of islets, and all of the cells in those islets had large nuclei. And so that's uh, what he called focal adenomatosis, meaning it wasn't a tumor an adenoma, as we had seen previously in uh, the adult world, but rather it was a proliferation of, of what appeared to be somewhat normal cells, but they had these enlarged nuclei. And so, uh, in the mid-1990s, the, mid the Paris group, uh, led by um, Nicole Fekete, who was the surgeon, and Jacques Raye and uh, Pascal Delonle, and a few of her, their colleagues, really described the difference between focal and diffuse disease. And um, the, the one thing I forgot to mention is that when we go back to 1960, when we were operating on these children, we would start off and take out half their pancreas. And we noticed that a small number of kids were cured, but say 60, 70% of the kids were not cured. So then the surgeons started taking out 75% of the pancreas. And we noticed now that the cure rate went up to about um, 25 to 30%. And then we started taking out 80 to 90% of the pancreas and our cure rate kept going up. But when we got to 98% of the pancreas, we seemed to get stuck where about half the kids were cured and half weren't cured. And, and so that's what led Jacques Raye to make the pathological uh, diagnosis. 